Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Jennifer Spence, and I'm the Bookkeeper and Administration Assistant for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Thank you for attending today's webinar, CCSN's Ontario Virtual Action Week, COVID-19 and Cancer Care Wave 2. Um, CCSN is pleased to welcome presenters for today's webinar. We are joined by Conrad Eder, CCSN's Public Policy Analyst, Conrad holds a BA in economics and is an experienced researcher and writer who is passionate about public policy issues. Conrad has been working closely with the data from our COVID-19 and cancer care surveys and has delivered numerous presentations summarizing the key points. We are also very fortunate to have four incredible patient advocates join us today. These four women have been a vital part of our meetings with Ontario MPPs this past April as well as during our series of meetings in this past October. First, we have Marianne Bradley. She's a proud lung cancer advocate who was first diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in 2014. She supports others who are also struggling with the disease, providing guidance and mentorship. Many have shared in her goal to build a Canadian lung cancer support community, which began with the creation of a Facebook, Facebook group for Canadians with lung cancer. It's called Canadian Lung Cancer Advocacy, Breathe Hope. The group is slowly building and offers support to lung cancer patients and caregivers from coast to coast in Canada. Next, we have Andrea Redway. She's a lawyer who spent her early years of her career in Toronto and China, and then later moved to Ottawa with her family to work on international justice reform projects in Asia and Africa on behalf of the Canadian Bar Association. In 2015, at the age of 47 years old, Andrea was blindsided by a diagnosis of stage four lung cancer. After two years of immunotherapy treatment, Andrea was able to stop her treatment and continue living a full and active life with her husband and two children. Andrea currently spends some of her time as an advocate for lung cancer patients with the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, Lung Cancer Canada, the Ottawa Hospital, and the Ottawa Integrative, Integrative Cancer Centre. Next, we have Diane Van Coulon. She was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer after a trip to the ER in 2019 for a chest x-ray to determine the cause of pain in her shoulder and spine. Since that time, she's had to quit her career as an elementary teacher and focus on healing and learning about treatments that can help save her life. She currently lives on a small private riding stable near the town of Beaverton, just an hour north of Toronto. She has two adult daughters and a wonderful partner that have remained by her side throughout her diagnosis. Finally, we have Deborah Penwick. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015 and went through excruciating chemotherapy and continues to live with lymphedema in her chest, arms, and back. Despite these challenges and her fear uh, brought on by worsening symptoms, Deborah epitomizes strength, grace, and positivity. She is fully engaged and feels strongly about sharing her story and paying it forward involved in projects that range from speaking engagements to supporting and presenting at the Gildas Club Toronto, mentoring and providing travel and travel insurance to those living with cancer, creating a give back project to Mount Sinai and creating cancer thrive retreats and wellness travel opportunities through her accredited focus as a certified wellness travel specialist. In today's webinar, Conrad will begin by sharing some of the highlights from our meetings with Ontario MPPs. He will then turn things over to our patient advocates and they will share some of their reflections of our meetings as well as their own experiences with assessing cancer during the pandemic. Lastly, Conrad will be taking a closer look at the Ontario data from our survey. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for a Q&A session. Please submit your questions in the chat box. Additionally, please remember to keep your mic and webcam off. Just a little quick bit information about CCSN. For those of you who have not attended an earlier webinar for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, uh, we are an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about health system complexities. We connect with others to plan action and act to promote the best care and healthy survivorship. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at survivornet.ca. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. In addition, the slides will be available in SlideShare. Links to, to both will be sent to your email provider. Now I'll turn things over to Conrad. Excellent. Well, as Jennifer 
uh, laid out for us today. I'm very pleased to be able to talk about CCSN's now second virtual action week in the province of Ontario. I'm very pleased to be joined by a number of patient advocates who took time out of their weeks, but really what ended up being a month of meetings uh, to join me in discussing a variety of critical issues, uh, including about our Cancer Can't Wait campaign, focusing on our COVID-19 and cancer care survey. There we go. Uh, today's presentation will be broken down into three major components, uh, as Jennifer alluded to. The first part, we're gonna start off by talking a bit about our Ontario Virtual Action Week. I'm gonna, a, gonna give a little bit of background into what that week was really made up of, some of our meetings, major conversations that we had, uh, and also, show a little bit of highlights, some clips of our meetings with MPPs. Uh, perhaps you might recognize some as your own if you live here in the province of Ontario, but I think it'll be really insightful to hear directly from those members some of their thoughts and reactions to the meetings and presentations that we gave. What's also incredibly important in this discussion about our virtual action week is going to be the perspective of the many patients that joined us during those meetings. So we're very pleased to be joined by Andrea, Diane, uh, Deborah, and Marianne to talk about their reaction to the week, uh, their interaction with the members. Uh, and I'll leave it there and we'll, we'll let them get into those comments a little bit further on. Uh, the second half of the presentation will be an opportunity to jump in to our Ontario data set. I've been very fortunate now to have been able to do a few of these presentations focusing specifically on different regions of Canada, how they relate to our overall national data set and compare to different provinces. Uh, finally, we're going to end with a question and answer, and I really look forward to taking your questions. I know that uh, many of the advocates will also be sticking around for that Q&A. So if you have any questions for them, be sure to include those in the chat. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to address them. So we'll start things off with our Ontario Virtual Action Week. Uh, again, this has become a major theme that these weeks quickly turn into months. Uh, our Ontario Virtual Action Week took place between April 7th and May 11th, which was yeah, just a couple of days ago we wrapped up our final meeting. And we met with a variety of elected officials and bureaucrats within the Ontario government from all across the province. And we really have two primary goals or overarching goals to our meetings. First and foremost, we want to amplify our message. And second, it's also about building relationships. As I alluded to, this was our second Ontario Virtual Action Week. So it was an amazing opportunity to reconnect with some MPPs that we had met with in the fall would have been our first virtual action week, uh, but also a chance to begin to build communications and relationships with some MPPs for the first time. Our meetings had three primary focuses. As I mentioned earlier, we wanted to talk about our COVID-19 and cancer care survey. Now, this was a national survey that was done all across the country that included patients, pre-diagnosis patients, and caregivers, and was meant to give us a little bit of insight into what cancer patients and the broader cancer community were dealing with when it came to accessing care and cancer care services in particular over the course of the pandemic. The second thing we wanted to do was bring up concerns about accessing care in Ontario. And this specifically took the form of access to surgical procedures in the province. We know in Ontario, but broadly across Canada, there have been issues of backlogs, not only in terms of procedures, but also diagnostic tests and it's incredibly important that we bring that attention to the government. And finally, third, COVID-19 vaccination has been a major theme of many of the virtual action weeks that we've had over the course of the last several months. So we wanted to make sure we were addressing the government and mentioning some of the concerns uh, and also some of the progress that has been made in terms of ensuring that cancer patients are prioritized, not only for the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, but ensuring that they get timely access to that second dose, which is incredibly important for their protection. In total, there's our list of MPPs. Uh, and I should also point out that we met with representatives from the Ministry of Health. Uh, these meetings, I would say on the whole, were quite productive, uh, but we'll get a chance to hear directly from those MPPs and the clips that we've assembled. Uh, and also uh, we'll have an opportunity for our patient advocates to uh, tell you a little bit more about our interactions with these various MPPs. In all of these meetings, we broke it down into three general sections. First and foremost, we wanted to address the problem that we see, particularly in the province of Ontario. And this largely has to do with access issues, whether that's access to a procedure, access to a diagnostic test, or specifically we've been addressing recently, access to a COVID-19 vaccination. We've seen not only anecdotally, but also through our research across Canada, that there are issues and barriers that persist. 
So clearly, what's the solution? Well, we need to ensure that we're removing as many of these barriers as possible and making sure that cancer patients are able to get access to incredibly important diagnostic tests, treatment, and other healthcare services. And that's why we've been calling on the Ontario government to institute a cancer recovery plan. We hear a lot about an economic recovery plan in Canada and in Ontario in particular, but we know that cancer patients cannot be left behind. And it's so important that a cancer recovery plan be put in place. And that includes a few different components. The first of which is to address the backlog in surgeries that exist within the province of Ontario. And I mentioned this briefly, but I wanted to point to a specific report from the FAO, the Financial Accountability Office here in Ontario, that did an estimate of the significance of the surgical backlog and diagnostic backlog that exists within the province. We brought to the government's attention that we're looking at more than 400,000 delayed procedures by the end of September 2021 and more than 2 million, 2.5 million procedures relating to diagnostic tests are set to be delayed by the end of September, 2021. This is incredibly important as we mentioned for patients, but also for pre-diagnosis patients, which we feature in our national cancer patient survey, because what may be a pre-diagnosis patient today could very well be a patient tomorrow in need of necessary care. The financial off the, pardon me, the Financial Accountability Office estimated that it would take 3.5 years to clear the surgery backlog and over three years to clear the diagnostic backlog in Ontario. These are incredibly important access issues within the cancer community. And this is one of the major facets of our presentation. The second key area when it comes to access is the COVID-19 vaccine. And here I've just put up a few bullet points that relate to a very commonly shared research study that was done out of the United Kingdom that specifically focused on examining the level of immune protection conferred on a cancer patient versus someone without cancer in the general population. And what it found is that cancer patients were not getting the same degree of protection from a single dose of the COVID-19 vaccine as someone without cancer. And it was based on this research and a magnitude of research done across the world that we've been calling on Ontario and a variety of other provinces across Canada to ensure that cancer patients are not only prioritized for their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, but also get their second dose within the manufacturer recommended time frame, three to four weeks. So what has been accomplished on these two major fronts? Well, the first thing I want to touch on is the surgical backlog. The Ontario government has recognized, thanks to the voices of the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network and numerous other organizations and advocates, that this surgical backlog needs to be addressed. And so in their recent 2021-2022 budget, when specifically looking at resources allocated to the hospital sector, they set aside $300 million for that fiscal year to reduce the surgical backlog caused by delays as a result of COVID-19. Now, this is a positive step insofar as the government has recognized that this is a major issue and needs to be addressed. Whether or not $300 million in the 2021-2022 year is sufficient to address the backlog is another question entirely. And I did just want to grab a quick note here to reference the FAO report. That was the report that I just mentioned earlier. It touched on the significance of the surgical backlog in the province of Ontario. They also did an analysis on whether or not the province has set aside sufficient funding to address the backlogs that it identified. And what it found is that Ontario is in need of $1.3 billion alone to address the surgical backlogs caused by COVID-19. Just to break that number down a little bit finer, specifically as it addresses cancer care in the province, the FAO report cited that it would cost $57 million in order to address the cancer surgery backlog. And, and this is another particularly interesting number when it comes to diagnostic tests. They estimated a cost of $241 million in order to eliminate the cancer screening backlog that exists in the province. I think the main takeaway here is it's a positive step that the government has recognized that this is an issue. And we're glad to see that resources are being put towards it but it's incredibly important to be cognizant of the overall investment that's necessary 
to fully tackle the backlogs that exist in order to ensure that cancer patients and pre-diagnosis patients are being given access to the services that they need. And then second, talking about the vaccine. So in particular, and this happened a bit more than a month ago, we know that the Vaccine Clinical Advisory Group here in Ontario recommended that the Ontario government reduce the dosage timeline for those who are immunocompromised and immunosuppressed. They also made reference to cancer patients in that order, in addition to those who have had a transplant surgery. That's been put in place, which we very much applaud. Ontario, Alberta are two provinces who have taken the lead on this, and we hope to see more and more step up to ensure that cancer patients receive the second dose of their COVID-19 vaccine within the manufacturer recommended timeframe. Now, of course, does this mean the problem is solved? Unfortunately not. And uh, what we'll hear from our patient advocate panel today when we uh, ask them a few questions about their experience, I'm sure they'll be able to tell you that either they themselves or individuals that they know of have incurred challenges, whether that's receiving the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine or securing a second dose within the three to four week time frame. So all in all, it's good to see that the government has taken this step in ensuring that cancer patients receive their second dose in a timely manner, but that's not necessarily solving the problem in various areas across the province. And the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network will continue to advocate on these issues, ensuring that they remain top of mind for the government moving forward. What is of particular interest to me, and I'm sure to many of you, is the categorization of those meetings from the very patients who were in attendance sharing their thoughts and their concerns with those representatives. Now, before we uh, begin to ask some questions, I did want to pause yet again and thank all of these ladies for taking the time to join me and my colleagues in meetings with MPPs over the course of the last month. As, as I say, whenever I have an opportunity to do publicly, we really appreciate the effort uh, and the time commitment that all of these patient advocates have put into these meetings, sharing their concerns and providing a personal touch to our advocacy makes all the difference. It, it makes such, such a difference in the world. So we really appreciate all of your time and, and yet again, uh, being here uh, to give a little bit more context to the meetings that we had with those representatives. So uh, thank you all very much. And I'll start off uh, with a handful of questions here, uh, which um, I'm sure our audience is really interested to hear your feedback on. Um, Andrea, if I can, I I'd love to ask you the first question, uh, which is, having met with several members of provincial parliament from many different parties, I'm wondering if you feel as though the concerns that we shared were heard um, or even maybe addressed in some ways. Um, thanks, Conrad. Well, you've, several of the MPPs I met with were in the video clips that you just showed. And I think I think everyone could hear in those clips that there was real interest and real concern in the issues. Um, and my experience generally in meeting with uh, MPPs is that they're, they're people and uh, they have families and they live in their communities and are, are um, very connected with their communities. And so they care what's going on. Um, I found them very attentive in, in all of our meetings. I found them very respectful of the, the issues that were being presented. And um, also many of them recognize the great work that CCSN is doing and continues to do um, in raising issues for cancer patients. So that was nice to see that recognition. Uh, but I find, I find that is important is to um, cast the problems when they're presented in a light that really demonstrates how it affects the people in their, their constituency, um, how it impacts uh, uh, the people they represent, that they serve, and uh, that ultimately are going to vote for them in the next election. Uh, and, and as you, you saw, um, uh, people like MPP Joel Harden, who's uh, my, my representative here in Ottawa Centre, uh, is also the opposition critic for people with disabilities. And so he really recognizes that uh, people with cancer fall into that category and was very interested in learning about uh, um, concerns uh, or, or in the impact on people in his, his constituency. Uh, similarly, uh, MPP Jeremy Roberts for 
Nepean here in Ottawa for Ottawa West Nepean, um, I think really heard the concerns about the vaccination issues and, and the implementation of the, the second dose for cancer patients and the struggles that we're hearing and committed to go and to and speak to Ottawa Public Health as he was having regular meetings with them and to raise those concerns directly with Ottawa Public Health. So I thought that was great. Awesome, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I think very much in line with that question, uh, Deborah, I know that we had an opportunity to meet with representatives from the Ministry of Health in particular, uh, as well as a number of other MPPs. How would you describe the overall tone of those meetings? Well, I, I think the overall tone was, you know, one of understanding for the most part, uh, you know, I think we boggled their brains with the facts and the numbers to understand the reality of how it is actually reaching the cancer community. I think also the more personal connection we could put to it, the more it resonated with them, especially if they have a personal connection to cancer. But I think the reality of the disparity of what constitutes good health management for a cancer patient versus a regular Canadian was really a highlight that that shifted that tone and, and made them ask more questions and want to know more and, and get more follow up with you to be able to have more details to share with their higher ups and to be able to actually say, you know, we're frustrated too. Uh, that I think was was a great piece to be able to see and experience that there there is honesty somewhere in that message. Uh, from their side as well as ours. And, and I hope that that means a, a greater push for them to try and do more for us. Absolutely, uh, that, that's very true. Um, Marianne, did you feel as though the MPPs were receptive to the concerns that you shared? I know uh, having worked with um, many other lung cancer patients and survivors, uh, you related many stories that you've heard. Uh, did you find that the MPPs were receptive to those concerns? Oh, sorry, Marianne, you're just on mute. I guess you can't unmute me. <laughs> oh, you're all set. There you go. All good. Okay. Uh, yes, I did, Conrad. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting with Member of Parliament Laura May Lindo from Kitchener Centre uh, on two separate occasions. And Minister Lindo is such a vibrant, upbeat, compassionate, and caring woman. Uh, she is very involved and listens intently uh, to what advocates are saying on behalf of all cancer patients. Uh, we spoke in length about the importance surrounding the COVID-19 survey from CCSN and how COVID has affected those patients in treatment awaiting surgery. Minister Lindo has felt the effects personally as a caregiver to her husband, who unfortunately um, passed away from cancer. She comments on the significance of cancer treatments and surgeries not being delayed and truly supports all of our advocacy efforts and relates that she is there to help us in any way. So overall, the meetings were very well received. Our message was important. It really was a pleasure speaking with an MPP that is truly involved in her community as well as with the province. So I think uh, it was a very, very positive outcome with meeting with all of the MPPs uh, from our general meetings. Certainly. Now, I know that Diane, that some people might be a little bit more cynical and, and not feel as though these meetings with members of parliament or members of provincial parliament really make a difference. Um, do you feel as though we've been able to make a difference through these meetings with the MPPs? The short answer to that is yes, I do. This was my first foray into MPP land, working with CCN as a patient advocate. So I didn't know what to expect initially. Um, but as I met with more, more of them, I thought, like someone else mentioned, they are people too. And on one occasion, one MPP, I actually, actually became emotional when she listened to my story. That wasn't my intention, but because she also had a personal connection to, to cancer in her family, she understood exactly what I was saying. And I mean, that was validating in a way because it meant that we have elected officials who also are experiencing the day-to-day 
concerns and, and challenges of, of taking care of someone with cancer and knowing what COVID has done to the care for cancer patients. And um, another, another one actually said to me, you know, if you belong to an advocacy group, use your voice, be loud, be as loud as you can. And prior to that, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be very quiet, not stir the boat. But now I realize sometimes you do have to uh, stir the waters in order to be heard. So that was good for her to, en to encourage, you know, us as a, as a group to do. Also, uh, several of them, Conrad, if you recall, during the meeting, asked you for more specific data to dig a little deeper into the numbers because they wanted to take those and then use them um, in their own you know areas whether wherever they were going to go forward so yes I was surprised to feel that the MPPs did indeed listen to us I wish we could almost meet with more of them like get a broader scope of MPPs across the entire province you're absolutely right we heard from many MPPs that asked uh, for follow-ups. Uh, just for context for everyone listening and watching today, our meetings, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but our meetings last generally 30 minutes. That's about as much time as we have with them. Uh, that usually affords us a few minutes in the beginning just to chat, uh, about a 20-minute presentation, uh, and then we usually try to reserve about uh, five or 10 minutes at the end for some questions and some comments from the members. Uh, often that doesn't quite give enough time to give a uh, too much of an in-depth presentation, particularly when it comes to some of the statistics, um, as I've chopped them up in a thousand different ways at this point. Uh, but they have always asked for a lot of follow-up data, which has been great, and we've been more than happy to provide them with that insight. Um, Andrea, I know um, we met with uh, several MPPs now uh, this time around uh, for our second Ontario Virtual Action Week, but also before. Um, so I thought I'd ask, having met with now quite a few MPPs alongside CCSN, was there any meeting or two that stood out to you? Maybe why that was? Uh, thanks, Conrad. Yes. Um, well, the first clip you showed was, was of MPP Kusindova. And um, she was our last meeting, but particularly stood out because, uh, well, for one reason, she's a registered nurse herself. And I learned from that meeting that she had... Uh, last year in the first wave of the pandemic had actually gone back and taken shifts at Etobicoke General Hospital to help out, which I thought was amazing. But she also talked about her father-in-law who was impacted by cancer as well and how they'd been trying to get him his second dose in a timely manner. So she had a very personal connection uh, as well as a professional connection to the, the healthcare situation. And she was, as Diane, pointed out one of those MPPs who asked for data. She asked for the research on um, the impact or the how uh, the study from the UK on uh, vaccinations and how they have less impact for on cancer patients who are currently on treatment. Um, she also asked for the research uh, that she presented on the or that we presented on the increased mortality rates that can result from delays in treatment. Um, so she was very interested in really the substance. And um, she she also offered to make a statement in the legislature about our meeting and about the work that CCSN is doing. So I thought that was great. I don't know whether she's had a chance to do that yet. But that contrasted with some of the other meetings. Um, I won't mention who in particular, but one of the other meetings where there was a lot of um, acknowledgement of the problem, but there was also a lot of um, uh, pushback of blaming the problem sort of on the other levels of government and um, other actors uh, and just repeating sort of that. Uh, so that was, was less, less uh, rewarding a meeting, I would say. Uh, and I think, you know, all of the MPPs we meet with are looking for concrete solutions um, that can make them, uh, their party look good, that the, can make, if they're a government MP, that can make the government uh, look good. And they really want to show results that can resonate with the voters. So that's really what they're looking for. They want, they want concrete solutions. Sometimes I thought it was a bit unrealistic to push back the surgery issue to us to ask for solutions, we're highlighting the important um, data that they need to then take 
and work with the medical professionals to come up with the solutions. But sometimes they were asking us for um, solutions that I didn't think really was the role that uh, we should be playing. Absolutely. And Deborah, <laughs> I, I think that Andrea makes a good point. Overall, we had many very positive and productive meetings, but there were a few that stood out for not great reasons. Um, with that in mind, what would sort of be your outlook in the province of Ontario? Do you think we're heading in the right direction? Do you feel as though the meetings had you leaving with a, a bit more positivity or maybe a little bit more pessimism? Thanks, Conrad. I would like to say that I'd like to stay optimistic. Um, being that this has been a big haul to get to where we got to, to begin with, and to be able to bring facts and figures to them to make them aware. I hope that we've been able to highlight the stop gaps that really need to have a highlight. Um, the whole message of cancer can't wait, I think was delivered to a lot, whether or not they'll be able to take action and be able to create some significant action for us to benefit from. I'm not sure that we'll see that in the immediacy. I, I think, unfortunately, we're still going to see a, a huge amount of people who are facing a much more dire diagnosis or a much dire situation of, of treatment options because of this delay, um, because of, you know, the idea of encompassing and providing confidence. Um, I don't know that we are, are there. I don't know that we're going to get there this year, to be honest. Um, I think a lot has to change throughout the summer. So I'm optimistic, but I think the work that we're doing has great value. And I think we did reach a lot of people that, that are able to then translate it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, we've heard quite a bit today already about some meetings that have stood out for one reason or another. Was there one interaction or a particular MPP that stood out to you that we had a chance to meet with? Yeah, I was really fortunate to meet with um, Francis Jolinais or Jelena, sorry, from Sudbury North. And she actually is the health critic as well. So she plays a very significant role in parliament. And she was so intent on, on listening to that survey and, and again, collecting the data and the numbers. And what was really, really interesting is very shortly after that, I saw her deliver um, our message in in Parliament where she stood up and she talked about cancer can't wait and and the impact of, of delaying everything and it was that was the moment like wow we can make a difference just because you know one MPP chose to stand up and, and knew the process and the protocol that was needed to get um, you know to, to get our message into the Parliament at the right time before you know it would have been too late so that was really interesting. Absolutely. Uh, and I do have uh, one last question for you, Mary Ann. Um, of course, uh, you've all taken time out of your day to join us and, and we really appreciate uh, all of your efforts and energy that you've put into our Cancer Can't Wait campaign and our virtual action week. Um, but I was wondering, do you have any words of encouragement or any tips for any patients who might be considering getting into patient advocacy? And, and as Diane referenced earlier, really increasing uh, their voice. Oh no, Diane, you're on mute again. Sorry, um, uh, Marianne, you're on mute again. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, thank you, Conrad. I personally encourage all of you who are interested in advocacy to take the plunge. So many different organizations need our help. And personally, I have seen how our advocacy works. CCN, for example, gives us the opportunity to share our platform um, and our concerns with the MPPs on a in the provincial government. They set the platform that we are part of the changes being made. For me, it gives me a sense of pride and accomplishment. And I would suggest for those of you who are interested to contact the Canadian uh, Survivor Network and speak with them about how you may fit in their platforms. As for the cancer agencies, I'm proud to sit on the chair for the, of Programs Committee for Lung Cancer Canada and the Advisory Committee for the Lung Health Foundation and Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Currently, I've been working with many other advocates, including um, uh, Andrea and cancer agencies across Canada, Canada lobbying provincial governments 
to support the four weeks, not four months campaign for second dosing of COVID vaccine for high risk cancer patients. That, I'm sorry, high risk cancer patients that are on immunotherapy and chemotherapy. So far, we have been able to confirm that Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and Quebec are on board with us. And we are now giving second doses within these provinces. Without advocacy, this would not have worked. Advocacy, advocacy starts with us and we have the ability to make change. I truly hope you consider using your voice in advocacy. Wonderful words, I think, to wrap up our patient perspective panel. Well, I have to say that a few times fast. Uh, thank you all so much, ladies, for taking the time to join me today. And of course, over the course of our virtual action week, we really appreciate all your contributions on behalf of myself, Jackie, and the entire CCSN team. So thank you very much. At this time in the presentation, we've been talking a lot about our Cancer Can't Wait campaign, and in particular, our COVID-19 and cancer patient survey. So I'm really pleased to be able to discuss that in a little bit more depth now, uh, specifically focusing on Ontario and how Ontario cancer patients, pre-diagnosis patients and caregivers have been impacted by COVID-19. First, I'll start off with just a very brief objective summary of our COVID-19 and cancer care survey. We've now completed two surveys, both with the same overarching objectives. First and foremost, we want to understand the extent of the disruptions caused by COVID-19 restrictions when it comes to receiving cancer care, whether that's surgeries or diagnostic tests or any form of healthcare service for a cancer patient. In addition to the physical health implications that we made reference to a little bit earlier, we also wanted to recognize the mental and emotional toll that these disruptions have had on cancer patients and their families. And then finally, and as I'll allude to in the following few slides, we want to touch on what are some concerns today, as well as some concerns moving forward when it comes to being able to access care in a timely fashion. This is just a variety of the research topics in particular that we've been focusing on. Uh, we have listed here appointments, whether or not they've been cancelled, how patients are interacting with the healthcare system, the emotional impact of delays, uh, whether or not patients have been reaching out to interact with their healthcare teams. We've asked patients, caregivers and pre-diagnosis patients to rate the quality of care that they've received. And as I mentioned earlier, identify some ongoing concerns when it comes to their healthcare. Briefly touching on methodology before I dive into the statistics, uh, we wanted to mention the fact that as I said, we've completed two surveys to this point. A first wave survey was done in May and June of last year and our second wave survey just wrapped up at the end of last year. With each survey, it became a little bit longer. We had a few more responses, which is incredibly important. And we have a great distribution of responses from all across Canada. Today, we'll be looking at primarily the Ontario data set, which makes up about 30% of the entire national survey base. Probably best to start off with a great overview for those who may not be familiar with our survey or haven't seen me or, or Jackie speak about it before. Uh, one of the main survey results, which has been widely circulated in all of the media, whether it's in print, uh, on camera, or over the radio that we've done, has been to emphasize the fact that cancer patients, their caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients continue to report having appointments canceled, postponed, or rescheduled. So what I've put up on the slide to begin with, if we look at the top row, is the percentage of those patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients who reported having appointment canceled, postponed, or rescheduled. The large black bolded number is the result from our second survey, and the smaller number in brackets is from our first survey. So you can see in particular, when we look at patients and caregivers reporting on behalf of patients, there hasn't been any movement particularly when it comes to the percent reporting having appointments delay. Pre-diagnosis patients, fortunately, if I can point out uh, one bright spot in this data set, have seen a decline in their appointment disruptions. But as I'll get into in a couple of slides, we attribute this mostly to the fact that pre-diagnosis patients have been seen to be less anxious uh, and less concerned about interacting with the healthcare system than they did during the first wave. Not to mistake the fact that concern still exists today, but to a lesser degree 
than it did in the first wave, particularly for pre-diagnosis patients. And that's exactly what I'd like to illustrate here as we begin to look specifically at the Ontario data set. When we look at Ontario patients and pre-diagnosis patients in particular, and we isolate for questions like doctors canceling or postponing in-person appointments or routine screenings for cancer being canceled or rescheduled, we can see that between the first and second wave of the pandemic, neither of these cohorts really saw much movement in terms of these delays being enforced on them by healthcare providers and the healthcare system. But there's another side to that coin, and that is patients and pre-diagnosis patients personally choosing to put off or postpone some form of healthcare service. So on the bottom half of the slide here, I've just isolated a couple of those examples. The first being those who personally chose to cancel or postpone an in-person appointment with a doctor. And the second, those who avoided booking an appointment with a doctor, even though they thought that one was needed. Now, this is incredibly a positive result to see that these numbers have declined over the course of the first to the second wave of the pandemic. We look forward to seeing whether or not this trend continues, but it's nice to see that cancer patients have been putting off and canceling their appointments less frequently during the second wave than they were during the first. Unfortunately, however, when you add up the number of Ontario cancer patients who had an appointment canceled or postponed against their will, or avoided booking an appointment or canceled an appointment because they didn't have confidence interacting with the healthcare system, we found that 70% of Ontario cancer patients reported that this was the case, and 62% of Ontario pre-diagnosis patients, so well, above, well into the majority of Ontario patients and pre-diagnosis patients expressed express that they were facing barriers when it came to accessing care. So what does this look like in a national context? Well, we looked at seven regions across Canada with the Atlantic provinces being put together as one. And we found that Ontario ranked number one and, and not in a good sense, they had the highest percentage of patients report that they had an appointment canceled or canceled their own appointment. Slightly better when we look nationally for pre-diagnosis patients across six regions in Canada, Ontario ranked number four. With that in mind, we know that appointments were canceled by the healthcare system or put off by patients out of fear for contracting COVID-19 or a lack of confidence in the health procedures put in place. This has resulted in extended timelines to reschedule appointments and surgeries. So what I wanna highlight first of all is the rescheduling time for an appointment specifically in the province of Ontario. And we can see that Ontario cancer patients took almost 40 days to reschedule an appointment. And for pre-diagnosis patients, that was about 25 days. When we look at that in the national context, we can see that Ontario is relatively on par, both when it comes to patients and pre-diagnosis patients waiting to reschedule an appointment. One last thing that I do wanna highlight on this slide, however, is the percentage of those at the time of completing our survey who did not have a rescheduled appointment time yet. And that sits at about a third of both patients and pre-diagnosis patients simply being in a state of limbo, not knowing when their appointment was to take place. Similar story when we look at surgeries, but even more exaggerated timelines, Ontario cancer patients waited an average of 51 days to reschedule a surgery. Pre-diagnosis patients, that number was slightly less again at 44 days. But what's particularly notable on this slide is that now 40% of patients and half of pre-diagnosis patients at the time of completing the survey did not have a rescheduled date at all. And this, as, as we'll go into in, in a couple of slides further, has been a major driver when it comes to what patients and pre-diagnosis patients have been saying about being unsatisfied with the care that they've received, being in the state of limbo and having an unknown date for their appointment or surgery has been driving that dissatisfaction. Again, briefly putting this in the national context, we can see that pre-diagnosis patients reflect fairly similarly to the entirety of the data set. Uh, as a potential bright spot, we do see that cancer patients in Ontario have been waiting less days than the national average, uh, but I wouldn't go on to throw a party quite yet as 51 days is still significant, both when it comes to the mental health impact, but also the physical health impact on patients and pre-diagnosis patients waiting for an appointment or surgery.
And that's the next couple of slides that I'd like to touch on. First of all, speaking about the mental health impact of these delays. We asked patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients whether or not these appointments were having a huge impact on their mental health. And quite unsurprisingly, a vast majority of all three of these cohorts said that that was very much the case, with about 70% of patients and pre-diagnosis patients saying that it was having a major impact on their mental health. And even more significantly, upwards of 80% of caregivers responded the same. In addition to the mental health impact that these appointment and surgery delays have had on cancer patients, uh, we've, and this was included in a couple of the presentations that we made to the members of provincial parliament that we spoke to here in Ontario, is the fact that physical health implications are very much at stake when it comes to delaying appointments, particularly surgeries for cancer patients in the province of Ontario. And so I just want to briefly highlight this British Medical Journal study that looked at 34 studies published between 2000 and 2020 to try to find some association between cancer treatment delays and mortality. What they found in this meta-study was that a four-week delay in receiving cancer treatment was associated with somewhere between a 6 and 8% increased chance in death. We know in particular when it comes to cancer patients, canceling their surgeries or even their appointments could result in delay in accessing care, but even more so for pre-diagnosis patients who are unsure if they have cancer uh, diagnosis or not, putting off their appointments and surgeries could have a significant impact on their long-term health. Next, I wanna to touch on some of the concerns that were raised when it comes to accessing care as part of our survey. And what I've put up on the screen here is an analysis over the course of the pandemic about how cancer patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients have felt about their ability to receive adequate care. And we can see that in the beginning of the pandemic, concerns were a little bit lower. They increased over the course of the first wave of the pandemic, falling down slightly after the first wave peaked, and then resurging at the second wave of the pandemic, where we can now see that Ontario pre-diagnosis patients are actually now more concerned than the caregiver counterparts in our survey. For a little bit of national context, I've layered on top the Canadian data, and we can see that generally speaking, the Ontario data versus the entirety of the data set mirror fairly consistently across time. But the one area to highlight would be specifically during the second wave of the pandemic, now the swap that has occurred with pre-diagnosis patients and caregivers in Ontario. Across Canada, if we look at the entirety of our data set, we found that in the second wave of the pandemic, caregivers continued to be more concerned than pre-diagnosis patients. But that's not the case in Ontario. In Ontario, pre-diagnosis patients are now the most concerned cohort in our study. Breaking down some of these concerns a little bit finer, I wanna highlight the three areas in particular that patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients highlighted as their greatest areas of concern. First is the ability to receive hospital care if needed. Second is the ability to be cared for in an emergency room. And finally, the ability to receive timely cancer treatment. What you'll notice across every cohort, patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients, more than 50%, almost more than 60% across every category are very concerned or somewhat concerned about their ability to access any of these healthcare services. But what's particularly worth drawing your attention to is the fact that in Ontario, across every cohort and across all three of the concerns that we see on the slide today, these concerns have increased over the course of the pandemic with more patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients being concerned about accessing care today than they were during the first wave. And so just a final few slides here to talk about how patients are interacting with the healthcare system and how they score the quality of those interactions. So first we'll start with those interactions themselves. And we can see that from the first wave to the second wave of the pandemic, patients have increased their interaction with both specialists and family doctors. Unfortunately, we did not see that same sort of increase with pre-diagnosis patients. 
Granted, pre-diagnosis patients continue to interact with their family doctors significantly more than patients do, but it's that lagging behind their interaction with specialists in particular is something that we're very aware of and look to keep track of over time as to whether or not pre-diagnosis patients will increase their interactions with specialists more in line with those of the cancer patient cohort. Likely a question you might be asking is how are those interactions taking place? And that's very much something that we're interested in doing our research. So on the slide here, we can see patients and pre-diagnosis patients. And on the other axis, we see virtual and in-person. So we're trying to, we're asking cancer patients and pre-diagnosis patients, what percentage reported a virtual or in-person interaction with their family doctor or a specialist? We can see that across patients and pre-diagnosis patients in the province of Ontario, virtual appointments are still taking place more frequently than in-person appointments. Now, this isn't necessarily the case across the country, though on average it is. Provinces like Alberta, for example, actually see more in-person appointments than virtual in some circumstances, but that's not the case here in Ontario. What I do want to point out in addition to the interactions that are taking place are the satisfaction scores that are being associated with each of those interactions. So in the case of virtual interactions, we can see that the percentage of those who said that they are somewhat or very satisfied with that interaction are generally somewhat less satisfied than being in person, not significantly. So in person, if we just take uh, patients as a brief example, looking at the red bars in the center of the screen, we can see that in-person interactions with specialists and family doctors, upwards of 90, 95% of patients said that they were somewhat or very satisfied with those interactions. Just behind that, hovering closer to 90% in terms of the satisfaction with virtual. So virtual still seems to lag slightly behind in-person, as far as how satisfied patients are with that form of interaction. And finally, more broadly, I wanna talk very briefly about satisfaction with quality of care received over the course of the pandemic. So what I've managed to put up on the screen right here is for patients and pre-diagnosis patients, those who were very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat unsatisfied or not satisfied at all with the care that they've received. And we can see in the province of Ontario, just over 60% of cancer patients responded to our survey that they were very satisfied with the care that they received. But this is in stark contrast to pre-diagnosis patients in the province of Ontario, but also generally across Canada, we found that pre-diagnosis patients are significantly less satisfied than the patient cohort when it comes to the quality of care that they received. To try and dig into those numbers a little bit deeper, given the limited time that we have to talk about it today, I've broken down on the screen some of the comments that we receive from patients and pre-diagnosis patients explaining why they felt that they were satisfied or not satisfied with the care that was delivered. So if we look at the left side of the screen, just to begin with focusing on patients, we can see that of those who responded that they were very satisfied with the care that they received, we saw an enormous percentage of those say that what was driving their satisfaction was the ability to be treated, have surgery, or be seen by a doctor on time. Not to mention the fact that appointments being kept was a major driver in that satisfaction. Those patients who reported being unsatisfied with the quality of care that they received is fairly predictably really the inverse of that feedback. So we can see that those who were unsatisfied said that the doctor was not available, or the status of their appointment was frequently a limbo. I, I made reference to that earlier as being a particular variable that drove patients and pre-diagnosis patients to not be satisfied with the quality of care that they received. And finally, just looking over the right-hand side of the slide, we can see pre-diagnosis patients. And this is a very similar story. Those who were satisfied with care spoke about the good service, the good support, and particularly the confidence in the healthcare teams that they were interacting with. And predictably, those who were not satisfied with the care that was delivered had similar comments to patients, saying that the delays were a major driver of their dissatisfaction, and also the status of their appointments being in limbo repeatedly came up, both for pre-diagnosis patients and patients, when it came to what they didn't like about the care that they received. Finally, just wrapping up uh, my presentation here, and then I look forward 
uh, to taking your questions. As I mentioned as well, uh, many of the patient advocates who I had a chance to do a, a little panel with earlier on have also stuck around. So I'm hoping that they may be able to uh, provide some insight to your questions as well. But I just wanted to give a brief, brief overview of looking forward at the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network and the kind of work that I'm up to. So first and foremost, I'm very excited to announce, which might be the first time publicly, uh, the third wave COVID-19 survey is currently underway. And we're gonna be focusing on all the same variables that I've had a chance to quickly go over with you today, but we're adding a couple more. And one in particular that I wanna briefly talk about is the vaccination within the cancer community. We know that this is a huge issue, not only in Ontario, but across Canada. So we're gonna be adding questions to our third wave survey that are focusing particularly on have cancer patients, their caregivers and pre-diagnosis patients been able to receive a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine? Which COVID-19 vaccine? Have they been able to secure a second dose? And we're also gonna ask questions relating to hesitancy. Perhaps cancer patients are hesitant to be vaccinated. And if so, we wanna understand if those reasons for hesitancy differ at all from the general population. We're planning more virtual action weeks to come, very much in line with our third wave survey. We hope to have our survey results and be able to make them public in the next couple of months. And that will coincide with additional virtual action weeks, not only in the province of Ontario, but all across Canada. So as Marianne mentioned earlier uh, during uh, the panel discussion, if you're interested in participating with CCSN as we interact, with members of legislatures across Canada. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to give you an opportunity to share your story and provide some of your feedback to maybe even if possible, your local MPP or MLA. And finally, that's very much in line with our overall objective and the work that I'm gonna to continue to do, which is working so incredibly hard on our survey, analyzing those results, and then making sure that we bring those to decision makers in Ontario and across Canada. That'll wrap up uh, my remarks for today. Uh, I thank you so very much uh, for your attention. I've put uh, my name and my email address on screen. So anyone who would like to reach out to me, whether with questions relating to our survey data, or you'd like to be more involved perhaps in a virtual action week to come here at the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, this has really been a core component of my work uh, since starting at CCSN. Uh, and I'm more than happy to discuss it and go into more detail. So thank you all so much uh, for your attention today. Great, thank you so much, Conrad. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have uh, come in. Uh, the first two actually were about uh, vaccines. And the first question was, how do we ask for an earlier second dose? I'm not getting any answers. Mm, yes, we've heard this anecdotally from many patients that we've interacted with. Uh, over the course of our virtual action weeks uh, across Canada. Um, I know that within different jurisdictions, unfortunately, the requirement could be different. So I don't want to give an overarching response. Um, I know that even each of the patient advocates on this call perhaps have had to go through different hoops in order to achieve it. Um, yeah, Andrea, did, did you want to speak to some of the challenges that you faced in trying to get that second dose? Um, well, what I wanted to say, and I was lucky I was able to get my second dose um, without uh, difficulty, um, but uh, if there are patients in Ontario having difficulty getting the second dose, there was a, uh, a directive that went out from the Ministry of Health to all the public health units across Ontario and the pharmacies across Ontario on April 16th, um, indicating that patients in the high, cancer patients in the high risk groups who are either uh, have certain types of blood cancers or are on currently on treatment should um, get their second dose within the product monograph timelines. And 15 patient groups have come together to send letters to all the public health units across Ontario, including CCSN, and it was uh, led by Lung Cancer Canada. And they've sent letters to all 35 public health units across Ontario to uh, advocate to have them actually implement this so that patients are not having difficulties booking these appointments because we are still hearing stories like that. And all the pharmacies also receive letters and all signed off with these 15 different cancer patient groups. So I have 
I have copies of those letters, I'd be happy to share uh, with people individually if the letters relative to their, their public health units. And uh, Lung Cancer Canada has also has copies, I know, of all those letters. Oh, Jennifer, you're on, just, on, just on mute. Terrific. Thank you, Conrad. No problem. <laughs> um, so the next question here I have is for Conrad. Can you please clarify what pre-diagnosis patients are? How are they defined in the survey? Mm -hmm. Pre-diagnosis patients are defined in the survey as those who suspect they may have cancer and either are currently or trying to undergo diagnostic tests to determine if they have cancer. That's differentiated from patient and early diagnosis patient. Uh, so we've kept, them, we've kept them as a separate category and try to understand some of the concerns that they have, particularly when it comes to reaching out to a physician or undergoing a test to determine if they have cancer in contrast to those cancer patients who have likely already be, been within the cancer care system for some time. Okay, great. Um, the next one again is about vaccines. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, but we'll give it a shot. Um, so this, this person is a survivor of lymphoma and um, they are worried about what vaccine they should be getting and uh, what would be recommended for a lymph for a survivor of lymphoma? Mm -hmm. no, it's a very excellent question. And I know that a lot of cancer patients and cancer survivors are very aware of this issue. The best recommendation that I can give is actually just to check out the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network's Facebook page or YouTube channel, because just a couple of weeks ago, we had on a number of expert doctors to discuss cancer patients and the COVID-19 vaccine. So I'll leave it there and really recommend that you check out our Facebook page or our YouTube channel you'll be able to find that webinar that uh, was again about an hour or so long that specifically dove into COVID-19 vaccines and cancer patients. Excellent, thank you, Conrad. Um, the last question I have here is, um, so it says, presume you've interacted with folks from the CCO, which I'm assuming is Cancer Care Ontario. Uh, who were they and what were their general takeaways from interacting with those folks? Hmm. Um, I wonder if, um, Deborah, I know that uh, we had a chance to meet with Cancer Care Ontario and um, maybe did you want to categorize some of our conversations with the Ministry of Health and the advisors that we spoke with? Um, sure, thank you. It, it's one of those things that <laughs> you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, these people are under extreme pressure right now to give you know, concrete answers to us, I think is a bit challenging for them because there's so many moving parts. But uh, I, I think they are very much wanting to hear from us, wanting to get that feedback, wanting to understand what exactly our, our troubles are, uh, getting to the things that we need to do so that they are much more aware and not um, you know, just going off of facts and figures that are just provided by a few, would they wanna hear from the many. Uh, and I think you know, the, the one opportunity that we had uh, with someone who had seen my face on another platform, it was a recognition of this is a little deeper. This is not just a surface problem that we need to solve. This is something that we need to dig in a much deeper process and give a lot more thought and consideration to. So please, you know, use your voice to be able to, to reach out to them. Um, as an association, as, as, a, as a community, we need to be able to really push on them uh, so that they can follow up with all the smaller agencies that need to do the deliverables. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and if I can add to that too, I think one of the takeaways and one of the reasons why we will absolutely be following up with those folks is that they were very curious about whether or not the cancer patient community, pre-diagnosed patient and their caregivers were being delivered COVID-19 vaccines as the province has directed. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the province's intention is for cancer patients to be prioritized not only for their first, but also for their second dose of the vaccine within the manufacturer's recommended timeframe. Right. Whether or not that's what's actually taking place is a big part of why we've been motivated to do this third wave COVID-19 and cancer care survey, because we're going to be specifically asking cancer patients, caregivers, and pre-diagnosis patients whether or not they've had access to vaccination. We ended that meeting very amicably, but mm -hmm. specifically noted the fact that we're going to be following up in a couple of months with our data set when it comes to the vaccination of the cancer community. I know that that's one issue they were very interested about. 
And if I can add to that as well, it, it was, I think, shocking for them to understand that I have only just received my vaccination from the eighth clinic I was registered at. So there, there is a distinct problem um, in certain areas and it, it needs to be addressed. So yeah, I can't wait for that follow-up. I'm sure they will have a lot more information as will we. Well, thank you for that, Deborah and Carmen. Excellent, that, that would be it for the questions. So I would like to just uh, thank everyone so much for attending our webinar today. Uh, CCSM would like to thank our patient advocates, Marianne, Deborah, Andrea, and Diane for sharing their unique perspectives with us. It's always very much appreciated. Um, our next webinar will be held next week on Thursday, May 20th. Um, the topic will be HPV prevention for cancer survivors presented by Dr. Nancy Durand, Associate uh, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Toronto. She will be joined by Abby Morris, a mindfulness, meditation, and yoga instructor who will provide some advice on how we can reduce and manage stress and anxiety in our lives. I'm just actually going to paste the, um, the link. So if anyone is interested in that webinar, the link is there for you to register. And that would be it. Uh, anyone else have anything else to say? Great. Thank you very much. And take care, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks.